Greetings to all of our Dominion family and friends and to everyone that's tuning in to, with us today. Thank God for his goodness, his grace, his mercy, and his love that he's poured into our lives. And I pray that you've had a blessed week and that this week will continue, uh, that you will continue to enjoy uh, being in the presence of the Lord and hearing what God has in store for you. So thank you for tuning in uh, with us on today. And so I want to just share with you what God has uh, again laid on our hearts. And this is a time, y'all, that we spend in uh, true worship before the Lord. So I want to talk to you about the priority of worship, the priority of true worship and being in the presence of the Lord, not just when we come to the building, but wherever we at, we can experience true worship because that's what the Lord has called us to do. So let's go to the scripture. The scripture says in St. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, but the hour is come and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking those to worship him in this manner. God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Some years ago, when the billionaire Howard Hughes died, his company's public relations director asked the casinos in Las Vegas, those casinos that he owned, uh, to show him respect by having a minute of silence. For that uncomfortable 60 seconds, the casinos were silent. Then the pit boss looked over uh, and watched and leaned forward and spoke into the mic. He says, okay, let the dice roll. He has had his minute. I wonder if uh, sometimes we treat God as those gamblers in Las Vegas treated Howard Hughes. We interrupt our busy schedules once a week, rush into the church or wherever, give God his hour or two and then forget about him and get back to what we'd rather be doing. We gotta remember this, that the life of the believer is about worship. Our time should be consumed in hearing what God is saying to us and worshiping and bowing before him, honoring him in everything that we say and do. The scripture says this in Revelation 7 chapter, uh, the seventh chapter, verses nine through 11. After these things I look and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, people, and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with their palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around uh, the throne and the elders and the four creatures and all fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Listen to what it says. They all gathered together to worship God. Well, y'all, since worship will be our ceaseless activity when we get to heaven, it's a good thing that we ought to be practicing it right here on earth. So let me, let me give you a few uh, definitions of the word worship. John MacArthur says, worship is our utmost being responding to the praise of all that God is through our attitude, through our actions, through thoughts and words based on the truth of God as he has revealed himself to us. To put it in a different way, he says, worship is all that we are reacting rightly to all that he is. William Temple said this, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. And to put it simply, I said this, worship is an inner attitude and feeling of awe and reverence, gratitude, and love toward God resulting from a realization of who he is and who we are in him. Worship, by the way, you all, is not music. Worship is loving God. Worship is honoring God. Worship is knowing God for who he is, adoring him, obeying him, proclaiming him as a way of life. Music is one way we express our adoration to him. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 31. 
whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Therefore, all of life is oriented towards God. That's the key that we have to remember. Everything that we say and do is oriented toward God, acknowledging God, and being in His presence and worshiping Him for who He is. So the question then says, why is worshiping God so important? There's nothing difficult about worship. Christians, non-Christians, every human being was designed to worship and does worship something. Consider a group of sport fans watching and talking about a game. They worship. Consider a group of people at a concert. They worship. We readily worship food, sports, arts, and music. We worship comfort, control, power, achievement, work, money, and relationships. But God has called us to worship him. He commanded, he desires it, he pursues it, he deserves it, and he will reward for it. For God bestows his provisions, his grace, his mercy, his sovereignty, and his power on those who worship him in spirit and in truth. But if you choose not to worship God, you need to understand that you are worshiping something. And whether you worship a job, achievement, money, or person, you are doing it so to your detriment. Revelations 15 and 14. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, and all the nations shall come and worship before thee. But thy judgment is made manifest. Worship begins, listen to me, worship begins with a redeemed heart occupied with God, expressing himself in adoration and thanksgiving. True worship is having a personal and loving relationship with God. So true worship then is distinguished by several things. It's distinguished by a person who has a redeemed heart, as I said earlier, and who has been justified before God by faith. And those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. It's also distinguished by a person who has a heart only, listen, has a heart only for God. We must constantly ask ourselves, what absorbs our will? What absorbs our time and our resources? Is it our careers, material possessions, money, health, or even our families? We cannot worship God and man. We either love the one and hate the other. Scripture teaches us in Matthew 5 and 8, the people draw to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. God desires a heart to worship him, the inner being of who we are, to acknowledge him and to worship him. <coughs> True worship of God is the desire to continue to build up our knowledge of God. We need to fill our minds constantly with the things of God. God should always, note this, God should always be on our minds, okay? And everything we do should be done with reverence towards him. True worship is seeing afresh the tremendous worth of God and in response, giving him the best of everything that you have. So I want to share with you today six reasons that guides us to true worship. The first uh, worship involves surrendering of our life. <coughs> Psalms 37 and 7 says this, Surrender yourself to the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not be preoccupied with the evildoers who succeed in their ways when they carry out their schemes and activities. Secondly, worship is, is putting our focus. Worship is putting our focus on him. True worship is based on our desire to honor God. It requires a personal uh, revelation of God as found in the word of the Lord. Worship is not based on my likes or my dislikes. It is not based on my personal preferences or priorities. It is a direct focus on him. Psalm 73 and 25 is recorded. Who have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides thee. Number three, 
Worship involves getting out of the way. We have to learn to remove our worries, our opinions, our questions. Our, we have to learn how to remove just ourselves so we can worship and appropriate, uh, I'm sorry, worship with appropriate honor towards God and letting go of us. Sometimes we get in the way of our own experiences of genuine worship. God wants our heart. He wants that inner being of who we are to yield ourselves to him. He is the author and the finish of our faith. It is he who has created us. Number four, worship involves personal sacrifice. It requires a sacrifice of our own feelings and fears so we can give him the focus that he deserves. Scripture says in Romans 12 and 1, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. This is your true and proper worship. Number five says, we must worship in the face of pain and loss. I'm reminded of uh, King David, who demonstrated uh, what it means to worship in the, in the midst of pain and loss. His baby had died when his wife had given birth and the baby had uh, died shortly thereafter. And I cannot, you know, I cannot imagine the loss of a child, okay? And the loss of one loved ones can be really hard to bear. But the Bible says in 1 Samuel 12 and 20, when they realized after they laid out before God that the baby was, uh, was dead and David prayed and prayed constantly and, and laid uh, uh, prostrate before God and asking God to bring his baby back to life. But it didn't happen. But so the scripture says in uh, 2 Samuel 12 and 20, then David got up from the ground. And after he had washed himself and cleaned himself up, he put on lotion and cologne and changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. So even in the midst of that loss and pain and the agony that he was experiencing, and some of us have, have even experienced the same thing, that we must continue to have that heart of honoring God. God is sovereign. Yes, he is. And therefore, even in the midst of our loss, even in the midst of tra tragedies, even in the midst of pain and suffering, we still have the responsibility that's laid upon us to honor God because of who he is because of the sovereignty of God and the love of God that God has for us. Y'all, let's take the time and let's worship Him. And finally, number six says, worship is celebrating who God is and what He has done. Shout unto the Lord, the 100th Psalm says. Shout unto the Lord, all ye earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God, is he who have made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks unto him and praise his holy name. For the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever. And he is faithful and will this faithfulness will continue throughout all generations. Well, six reasons I identified for you for worshiping God. But let me also talk about what happens when we worship. And perhaps the best way to describe this is in the book of Isaiah chapter 6. And it talks about Isaiah himself. And the scripture says this, in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord. And saw him seated on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and above him were the seraphim angels. And with each one of them had six wings, and with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. And they cried one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the sounds of their voices, the doorposts, and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. But I want you to take for a minute and pause and just think about Isaiah because there was three phases in his life that identified, that opened up that door for him for true worship. So first, he, 
Isaiah, when he experienced and saw the glory and the manifestation of God, then there was an upward look. He saw God in all uh, of his majesty. He saw the sovereignty and the greatness of God. That was that upward look. And when he looked up and saw God, then from that outward look, it turned to an inward look. And when he saw himself, listen to what he said. He said, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. So he felt that like he wasn't in a position to worship. He felt like that through his sins, he needed to be cleansed. And so God discharged the angel and took a coal from the fire and purged his lips. That inward cleansing, an inward cleansing took place. So there was an upward look, then there was an inward look. And then the Lord said unto Isaiah, Whom shall I send and who shall go for me? Then that's the outward look. So Isaiah said, Lord, here am I. Send me. So you know you have that up, in, and out. That upward look that we realize and acknowledge God for who God is. That inward look that we see ourselves that we are worthless and that we depend on God and what God can do in us. Then is that outward look. And that outward look is understanding that God has called me to action. God has called me to perform his will. And in all of those phases, I'm still in his presence to worship him. Okay? But it doesn't, it doesn't end there. Isaiah had that opportunity to go before the Lord and honor him in all of his actions. So in our text that we read in St. John chapter 4, Jesus encountered, uh, had the need to go through Samaria and he encountered a woman that was at the well, at Jacob's well, drawing water. And he had an interaction with her and said that the water that, uh, that you drink from will not last, but the water that I give you shall be in you a well springing up into everlasting life. And she realized that he was the son of God. And she declared unto him, in reference to worship. And she said this, beginning at the 19th verse. She said, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and ye say uh, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You know, there's going to come a time, or there is a time, <coughs> that during this season, that they all thought that they had to go to Jerusalem to worship. Well, <laughs> You know, keep in mind that it would be pretty difficult if all of us had to get on a plane and just go to, uh, to Jerusalem just to worship. But Jesus responded to her, and this is what he said. Woman, believe me, the hour come when we shall neither in this mountain or in, Jeru in Jerusalem worship the Father. But ye worship and know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And I'm grateful to God that the salvation was not just to the Jews, but to Jesus declared and said, whosoever will, let him come. But the hour will come. Now, Jesus said this. Look, and it's applicable to us right now. Jesus said the hour will come, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And the Lord has given us his spirit and has given us his word that we may know the truth. And for the Father is seeking, is looking for someone to worship him in that manner, in spirit and truth. And are you, are you the one that can bow before the Lord and open up your heart and say, Lord, here I am. I honor you because you are the great God. I honor you for the salvation and deliverance. I honor you for the healing, for the strength and for the hope that I have concerning my life. And so God is a spirit. And they that worship him must, listen to it, take note to it, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Psalms 95 and 6 says this, Oh come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Psalms 96 and 9 says, Oh worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. So I declare to you today, take the time. Not just on this day, Sunday, but take time in it every day. You know, no matter what you're doing, being about your business, but worship God in the process. Worship God in your thought life. Worship God from your heart. Worship God from your spirit. From that total, 
<clears throat> from that total being of who you are, bow before the Lord and give him glory, honor, and praise. So let's pray today. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we humbly bow ourselves before you and acknowledge you as the head of our life. Acknowledge you as the author and the finisher of our faith. We acknowledge you as Lord, King and King, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Lord, Lord, let our heart be open as we bow before you in worship. For you are the great God and beside thee there is none other. So Lord, forgive us of unrighteousness. Purify our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we can enter into your presence with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. That we can be thankful for you, Lord, throughout the course of our lives. And so, Lord, each and every day, Lord, give us the power, the strength, the knowledge to know you, God, and bow before you in worship. And we declare, Lord, that every day, every day, we live a lifestyle of worship. We live a lifestyle of praise. We live a lifestyle to honor you. This we pray. And we war off the hands of the enemy, but we speak victory. We speak mercy and grace. We speak hope and love into the lives of everyone that's listening today. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Thank God and amen. God bless you today. Thank you for being with us being in the presence of the Lord and hearing what God has said directly to you. So take the time and worship the Lord and have a blessed and wonderful day and see you on next week. God bless you. I love you.